Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Atomic Mass Transmissions Live. I'm with Schick, Director of Product Development for Atomic Mass Games. And today we are painting Mordo. That's right, he's a Baron, uh, Baron Mordo. <clears throat> Card got showed off last week in the panel of the play. I know everybody's very excited. There's been a lot of theory crafting around what he can do on the table. Uh, and of course, we're also going to be talking about the big bad Dormammu, who BK showed off his card in his panel to play today. So we'll talk a little bit about all the things that have been shown, get some paint on this Mordo, talk a little bit about the techniques to get him painted to an awesome standard. And uh, that's going to be about it for today. So with that in mind, I'm glad you're here. Glad you could join us. Let's get this camera off of me and on to the star of the show, which is our miniature Baron Mordo right here, ready to go. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start by getting some foundational colors down on the magic effects for his vaulting boots of Valtor. Uh, and to do this, I'm just going to grab some yellow ink. Whoop. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do kind of a two part process. So I'm going to wash all the spell effects with the yellow ink first to kind of um, build up a, undertone layer. And then I'm going to use some orange ink wash that I'm going to mix with using yellow ink and red ink. I'm going to put that over the top and that's going to give us our nice like orangey spell effects that you see from like the MCUs and a lot of the uh, other artwork that we've been seeing a lot for the Doctor Strange stuff. So typically these spell effects are typically drawn as like an orangey kind of glowy yellow. Uh, so that's what we're going to do here. And I find that this technique works really well. Uh, it's the same one that I used on this ancient one here. So I'm going to be using the exact same effects that I utilized on her spell effects here. And that really is just uh, yellow ink followed by an orange, uh, an orange wash over the top. Kind of let those co colors play together. And then you go back in and do a little bit of high key yellow uh, for highlighting and stuff. And you kind of bring everything up, but having that, foundational yellow base uh, is kind of the the first step the trick to it all I find to make everything look really nice and then we'll do something different for the smoke I can't decide I know Brendan who did an amazing job on the studio mini for Baron Mordo kind of painted the smoke as like traditional blue gray smoke um, but I was kind of thinking maybe like a magenta or a green could be fun uh, maybe even like a lighter purple. So I haven't quite decided how I want to treat the smoke yet, but we'll get to that here in a second once we get these spell effects done. Kind of going for that. And the big thing here when you're doing the wash is just to make sure that you're not filling up any of those nice pass-throughs on the spell effects. Normally when the paint dries, it's not going to, you're not going to get enough paint in there that it's going to fill up the, the little void, but it's always better if you just kind of take your brush and break up that surface tension anyway, just to avoid any chance of that happening. And also make sure that your paint is nice and light and your details are going to show pretty well too. All right. He is the second Baron. I'm, I've been very excited by all the discussions about the, uh, the Baron team of Baron Mordo and Baron Zemo. We're rocking along with, I've seen some people talk about taking the Barons with Dormammu. Could be pretty fun in a dark dimension scheme. Okay, I just want to come back through here, break up the surface tension on these. Little spots really quick. And then, from there. Okay, we're gonna dive in and smoke time i'm gonna go i think i'm gonna go with like a purpley black so i'm gonna use this violet color here the violet and i'm just gonna thin this out into nice little wash as well we're going from there all right so kind of like knock this in yeah i'm just using a little bit of water to thin this out into kind of a wash Ooh, that's still pretty thick. We'll just kind of come in. So if you find that you didn't thin everything out enough, uh, just rinse out your brush or grab a clean brush that's really damp and you can come in and you can kind of like thin the wash out on the mini itself. So you don't really have to worry about that. I think this purple will play nice with 
the orange that we're going to wind up with, obviously purple and orange are nice complementary colors. And it's got kind of that sinister magic vibe to it, you know, purple. Purple magic, slightly evil magic. As opposed to like blue magic. Orange magic kind of in the middle, I guess. Everybody's everybody's magic is orange these days now. So what do you do? But if you missed it, last week Dallas was painting the one and only Dormammu. He's going to be continuing to paint Dormammu this Thursday to round out our Crisis Protocol content for the week of streaming. I'm excited to see where he goes next. He's going to be doing a lot on the fire effects and talking how to paint Dormammu's uh, head, which is pretty unique since it is a skull encased in flames. And uh, obviously doing that in three dimensions in a miniature, uh, there's a little bit of sculpting magic that goes along with that in terms of how the skull is set in. And of course, there's a lot of painting magic to kind of give the illusion that the skull itself is actually encased in the flames that are around it and that there's flames over the top of it using really thin washes and glazes I expect he'll be doing. So all that stuff's going to be going on. All right. Perfect. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been, uh, I, I'll be honest, I have not been as productive as I probably should be today because I've been watching all of the hot takes on Dormammu and the Dark Dimension leadership. And uh, it's been pretty fun to just kind of watch people go crazy and lose their minds. So I'm going to go in. I'm going to make an orange ink using the yellow that I already had down, uh, using a little bit of Inktense Red. And then what I want to do is I'm just going to put this over our yellow, which will be mostly dry, but we should get a little bit of wet blending in the spots where it's still kind of uh, hasn't fully dried yet. And you could do this, you could do both these inks at the same time if you wanted to, to like really kind of mix with the colors and stuff. Um, I still have my yellow on the palette. So if I decide that I kind of want to do a little bit of that blending, depending on how my orange turns out here over the spell effects, I can do that. The big thing here is just going to be to make sure that we don't spill any or spill a minimal amount on the purple. Because I don't really want those two colors to mix if I can help it. That effect. This was such a fun, this was one of those times where we were talking about poses and what we wanted Mordo to do. And I was like, what about when he's using the vaulting boots? Because we knew that that was going to be a core piece of his kit for the game. And I was like, yeah. Like, And Dallas was like, what do you mean like, that scene and I was like absolutely like that scene from the movie and so we pulled it up and he's like I don't know and I was like I bet you can do it and once I say that to Alice, so I was like oh, I probably can we'll figure it out and so then he went to Marco and Evan and all the engineers and we kind of like worked it together with the sculptor uh, who just did an incredible job on bringing this all to life and I just love I love everything about this Mordo like it's just so fun all right so that's gonna be our first glaze of orange we'll probably do one more just to like strengthen it up and now while that dries we'll kind of dive into the rest of mordo so first things first i'm going to do a quick kind of gray wash over all the blacks using some rainy gray if i can find it there we go so i'm just gonna plot some rainy gray use this as a wash this is gonna be my undertone for my black we're going to be following the costume colors as close as we can, which I learned something looking at uh, some reference today, which is that you didn't know this, and I don't know why you would. Uh, his two sleeves are different colors, which is kind of odd. But, okay, so I think what we're going to do, we have black pants, black boots, We'll do the boots and the gray. So we'll undertone these in the gray. And we'll do the pants in our Holdra blue because we got to get Holdra blue in there. The sponsor of our painting jams. One Holdra blue. So we'll use that for the undertones for our pants, which will give them a nice kind of like blue tone. Should tie in pretty nice to the black. The big thing's going to be just kind of like pulling everything up. Uh, for those who are worried about stability and stuff, like he is. The magic effect is really nice and sturdy, you know. It's 
it's obviously going to wiggle a little bit, but you want it to. But it's like it's not soft at all. And then, of course, where he connects, he has a really nice thick plug from his foot into the magic down here. Um, so he's, you know, if he falls from a really great height onto concrete. He might not survive, but otherwise, uh, he should do he should do pretty well. We get the belt. And of course, if you're worried about while well, you're painting him, you could always take like a big old blob of blue tack, uh, which Dallas has showed off. I think he used that on Scarlet Witch at one point. You could, of course, paint them in subassembly. I didn't really feel the need to subassembly this guy, though, uh, just based on of how everything is very open on him. I normally only subassembly when I think I'm going to have problems getting to a spot that will still be visible to the eye. So obviously, if you can't see it, then what's the point in really painting it unless you want to be a completionist or you're going for like a painting competition. Obviously those considerations will definitely change uh, what you want to do and how you're approaching things. I'm also going to do the wrappings around the hands. And yeah, it's been so fun exploring. And I think like the mystic wave, as we've talked about, obviously there's a lot of crazy there's a lot of crazy uh, ideas that have been brought to life thanks to the talent of our engineers and our sculptors and the production team that's working these into plastic and making them producible in a mass uh, kind of way. So it's just been really awesome to see all of the teams come together and what we've been able to accomplish because of it. Okay, and then I think we're gonna come here. Most of his suit is green, but I have noticed that on a couple of versions that I've seen, there's like this piece right here that is like a black with a kind of a khaki stripe. So I'm just gonna hit that really quick. I'll give us a nice color difference. There's no right or wrong. We can do it however we want. Uh, and then that looks like that's going to be it. So we got to do the undershirts and stuff. We'll get to that next. But obviously, uh, Baron Mordo is, he's going to have that nice, as everyone has seen and been talking about, is that really nice, like backline kind of midline support character. Let's everybody else around him do uh, some pretty amazing stuff. He can generate his own power. So even if he's stuck on a point where, He's not making attacks with his Staff of the Living Tribunal or his Ranged Builder. He can still contribute by spending an action to gain some power. Works really, really well, of course, with his sometimes ally Dormammu. So it's always something to consider. With some Hammerfall. All right, so we're going to grab some khaki. This is kind of what I was talking about with the shirt sleeves being different. So the undershirt, the, which arm is it? So it's the left arm is blue and the right arm has like a CAD key to it. So this arm will be CAD key. It's really watery. We thinned that down just a little bit too much. Is there a new crisis card? Well, all of the card contents have been posted on the website. So you could definitely check there. Uh, I believe though, that there is one. And I wanna say it comes in the Doctor Strange and Clea pack, but it's been a little while since I checked. Um, so don't, don't quote me specifically on that, but you can definitely check the uh, gallery to find out if I'm telling the truth or BK will come in and just say yes or no. And we haven't even really started. To, I mean, there's so many things in this wave too. We haven't even started talking about one of my favorite characters who's also part of this wave, which is Dr. Voodoo. I'm super thrilled to introduce him into the game and we did some really fun design stuff with him that I think is gonna kind of make people think twice about how their plans are gonna go and what's what's gonna happen where. And 
the hood, of course, we haven't showed anything on his transformation mechanics yet, but of that character was just a blast and so much fun to put together. Also plays very, very well with Dormammu and his uh, Dark Dimension leadership, as you expect. My favorite, I think, with uh, Dormammu, though, was... Um, my favorite pairing in playtest with Dormammu is definitely Crossbones. And I will say that that Dark Dimension leadership gives you so much power, it becomes really hard to manage, and it's kind of like a blast. Because on the one hand, you're like, unlimited power, and then on the other, you're like, I have to spend this or I'm going to start taking damage. And it's, I don't know, there's something really enjoyable about playing a game of Crisis Protocol where you're desperate to spend the power and you can't seem to do it. Because normally you're just like, how do I make power? And with Dormammu, that is that is rarely a concern. Almost every time you're like, how do I not have six power by the time the next power phase comes around? And uh, that is that is challenging, let me tell you. That can be exceptionally challenging. <laughs> and then in more exciting news, you know, we, we've shown off the character stat card and stuff for the basic play, but we haven't really talked much about the ultimate encounter. And one of the things I'm looking forward to is that next week on Thursday, several of us will be going in and Dallas is going to bring in his painted Dormammu and we're going to we're gonna actually play the Ultimate Encounter for the first time on the stream. And that's going to be kind of the introduction to how the Dormammu Dark Dimension Incursion Ultimate Encounter works. You'll get to see how our Crisis teams hold out against Dormammu and his minions. We'll see that beautiful terrain put on the table that has an integral part to how the game itself is played. So oh, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a fun Thursday. It will definitely be a longer one, so you can plan plan it on being there a couple hours because games usually take a little longer, and of course, ultimate encounters can certainly get pretty tense. Uh, but we should have a lot of fun, and I'm I'm excited to show off all the components that go in with that. Um, there's some very neat things that we were able to do, and it it certainly takes everything that was great about the Thanos Ultimate Encounter and just kind of builds on it, takes it to that next level, uh, and it it definitely makes Dormammu even more scary than he normally is, which of course. I'm all about. I'm all about that narrative. Uh, we'll see who else we can get in for the fight. We'll probably have a Mordo running around for this and something else. So, I mean, generally the terrain that's in the box, of course, is just terrain that you can utilize on your Crisis Protocol tables like normal. So you can set the stage if you're playing Dormammu or if you want to have some more interest to your, uh, your general like city table, which I always think is really cool how it integrates, but in the uh, in the ultimate encounter itself, the terrain is actually markers for where the crisis teams have to go to complete their objectives, also where Dormammu spawns from, and where his minion characters, which he does get kind of like Thanos did, uh, also have to get to and from. They also provide benefits to the minions based on the proximity. So they're pretty important in terms of like marking uh, very important locations on the table and how the scenario unfolds around them. Um, and so you do have to be, they don't move or anything. It's not like they're, you know, they're not making attacks, but they definitely have a big impact on how the scenario unfolds and the strategies around it. You definitely want to try to do your best to make sure that Dormammu's minions and stuff are not near the... Uh, are not near the the pieces of terrain as much as possible because otherwise they become very, very difficult to deal with. So it's a lot of fun, for sure. And like I said, otherwise, you just get some really super sweet looking dark dimension terrain that you can use to stage an incursion of that location anywhere, anywhere you want on your tables. So I just went back and added another glaze of that orange ink, you can see how that's like really coming through and starting to really tie those two colors together. We're getting that nice glow. 
It does have a size value. You can't destroy it in the ultimate encounter, but of course you can throw it to your heart's content in the standard play games. Uh, okay, so let's go on and I'm gonna grab Misfits Green. I'm gonna use this for the basic green on Mordo's clothing. And again, I'm just gonna thin this out into a wash. We're gonna continue with our classic techniques of just using that Zenith Prime to really come together and work. Let's see how. All right, that's pretty good. This will be a nice kind of initial thin layer, so we'll keep this kind of kind of light. And then we'll build it up as we go. So this will be a little desaturated from where we want it to be. We definitely want it to be a lot bolder in terms of its color, but it's always best to start with a thinner, smooth layer and you can glaze up when you're doing this technique as well. So it's always easier to add more color, really hard to pull color away. Do, do, do. All right, so build this up. And then Dormammu and the Dark Dimension. Well, I'll be I'll be right up front. Uh, you know, it doesn't really make sense to have Dark Dimension specific affiliation cards because there's only one way to get Dark Dimension affiliation, and that's to take Dormammu. So technically. The uh, tactic cards that go along with that affiliation are specifically tied to Dormammu himself, but he does have two of two pretty uh, pretty impressive tactic cards that I'm sure BK has plans for how to show those off at some point. Uh, both of them feature artwork that is some of my all-time favorite Crisis Protocol artwork. Just some really incredible stuff from the two artists that worked on it. They are I just love how menacing and, and evil and sinister both pieces are. Uh, one of which, which is called Dark Restoration, also features my main man, Crossbones, which makes me love it even more. Is Clea affiliated? Well, I mean, yes, Clea is affiliated when it comes to the fact that, you know, if she's in the list with Dormammu, then, you know, it's all in the family at that point. But uh, the Dark Dimension, as we've talked about and kind of teased for a long time, the Dark Dimension affiliation doesn't work like a normal affiliation because it is just, if Dormammu is there, that's what you are. He doesn't work for nobody else. Uh, and that was a fun evolution kind of of the discussion where when we started working on Dormammu, his initial, one of his initial design notes um, that I talked about Pagani before he even started cranking out the design for Dormammu, because as I talked about last week, anytime we usually look at some crazy high cost, high threat level character that is also going to have an ultimate encounter, I always like to kind of defer to Pagani. He's a big fan of designing big monster characters and over the top, like, uh, bad guys and things like that. Like, uh, so he took he took the primary on that. And uh, one of the things that I said though when I started was like, okay, well, Dormammu can't work for anybody else. Like he he has to have some kind of rule that says, you know, your leadership doesn't affect him. And one, we, I liked that because I was sure that balancing, you know, everything that Dormammu could do and making him really powerful against whatever leadership might come later was probably going to be, you know, challenging to say the least. Um, but also because it just seems so in theme, like Thanos, we've seen Thanos work with other, with other people before in various storylines and things like that. Like he is pragmatic and uh, 
willing to, you know, put aside differences and, and work together on different stuff. But Dormammu, that's not, that's not his MO, you know, Dormammu is only interested in Dormammu stuff. So the rule to not allow him to uh, benefit from leaderships and things like that, to have him kind of always be his own, his own master was there from the start. But then as we play tested and we discussed the idea for doing a dark dimension affiliation came up that only he could unlock. And therefore it, it kind of solved both issues where now, you know, he could never, he would never be subservient to anyone else because he's always the team leader, but it also gave us the opportunity to kind of explore the dark dimension affiliation and the fact that Dormammu is always using people or taking control of their minds or whatever else he's doing. Um, so it was a really fun way to kind of add some extra flavor and, and honestly, uh, a cool, very cool leadership and tactical options that played with Dormammu and kind of incentivized what he wanted to do and how his further design was kind of like pulled together. So all in all, it was a great, it was kind of a great meeting of the minds and everything when it came down to it. Um, yeah, I think we'll do this. This will be fine. Let's go in and do these bands with the black and then we can come back through and cause they're, I'm not going to go crazy on the, on the hand straps in the costume itself. They're like multicolored kind of blue, gray, yellow. It looks like cause they have that kind of prayer band striping, but we're not going to do that on. This little tabletop miniature here will just make them look kind of nice and good and call it call it a day. Everything kind of simple. But I think we can go back in and maybe add some like blue tones or something to them. Just to make it nice. Uh yeah, and I mean there are certainly other characters in the Marvel universe that I could see maybe. But you know, I even even characters like chat's talking about, you know, characters like Apocalypse. Uh, we've seen Apocalypse work together with other people. You know, he's joined other causes, especially in the in the latest X-Men run. Spoiler alert, he's you know he's playing he's playing along, probably to his own game that we'll find out at some point, but he's uh he's not he's not quite like Dormammu is in terms of just completely unwilling to work together. And I would I know people will get mad about this, but I would argue that Doom is similar, in my opinion. Like, Doom has certainly done things for the greater good uh, with his own agenda, but, you know, he he's not quite as completely self-serving. Uh, no, I, I gotta be honest, like, Fallout Blood, I don't think anybody was really scared about making him too powerful for the base game, um, you know, if we could do it with Thanos, we knew we could do it with, with Dormammu. I think the bigger question just came down to, you know, how do you do it? How do you make sure that he's an interesting and powerful option, but he's not um, something that everybody's just going to take. And it was the same with, it was the same with Thanos at first. Uh, the last thing we wanted was Dormammu on Dormammu action being every game. And so those kinds of like determinations and considerations become really important. And that's kind of what you balance around. And, you know, the other thing with crisis protocol in general is there's a lot of considerations that you can't account for. The game asks a lot of questions in play. And so even, you know, every, every character has the chance to have their big moment or to maybe do nothing in the game. And the biggest thing with high threat characters is they obviously get to do a lot more. So they minimize kind of that first concern of they didn't really get their chance, their moment to do their thing. Um, but, you know, making sure that thing is like really important and cool and crazy is always, is always the fine balance. And then making sure that they're telling that story and they feel really good in combination with other characters and all that stuff. And then you go to the ultimate encounter and at that point, all bets are off, you know, and that's the joy of making an ultimate encounter with these characters is there's, there are no rules, <laughs> you know, and if a character in an ultimate encounter 
wins the majority of the time, well, that's kind of the point of the ultimate encounters, right? If, if the ultimate encounter is too easy, there's nothing very ultimate about it. So you really get to go like pretty nutso uh, and take all those ideas that might be a little too oppressive for the standard game and put them into the ultimate encounter and create something that players really have to challenge themselves with in order to come out on top. And, and I think that's also really fun too. So, you know, the, the base game Dormammu is still scary, but he's either at the very start of the incursion where he hasn't amassed all of his crazy power or he's kind of at the tail end. And this is the final gasp where the heroes have shut off his, his wellspring of, you know, endless dark dimension energy. And now he's definitely in a vulnerable position, still very scary, but not quite as much. And that's kind of how you have to think about, you know, in terms of narrative balance and character balance and stuff. And then you go from there. But I think at the end of the day, the bigger concern is always doing right by the character, but always remembering it's still the game and that it has to have balance and there has to be counterplay. And, you know, somebody is always going to be upset that, their favorite character doesn't just wreck every single game that they're in. And I get that, but you know, it wouldn't be a very exciting play environment if one character was just so far and away the best. There's like, no, there's no way to do it. Uh, Okay. So we've done that. I'm going to grab a little bit of brown and chestnut ink, I think. And we're gonna go in and wash the cat key color. Uh, da, 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 da. If I can find my, if I can find my stuff, maybe I won't, cause I can't, oh, there it is. All right, so. Uh, yeah, and I see that folks asking about Blade, Moon Knight, Dormammu, so I know that the uh, oh, I was supposed to do that in black. Oh, I'll have to go back and fix it. That's okay. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, as I've mentioned on several streams, uh, global logistics, you know, even with places opening up and COVID vaccines more and more available and all that great news, um, shipping and global logistics are just getting hit by wave after wave of things. So if you work in Global shippings or logistics for any company, you know, my my heart goes to you. Um, I would say thank you immensely for what you're putting up with right now and trying to deal with to keep everything running, whether it's the team at Asmodee that's trying to get product to everybody right now and make sure we all have cool little uh, miniatures to play with and, and entertain us on our hobby time. Or, you know, you're trying to get food or lumber or anything else in the world anywhere else because uh you know i i get i get the rundown of it i get the bare gist and oh my gosh i just can't imagine there's a worldwide you know there's a ship shortage there's not enough ships and if there were enough ships there's not enough containers because there's a worldwide container shortage and if there were enough containers there's not enough pallets to put things on the container because there's a worldwide pallet shortage like it's just one thing after another after another uh, it's, it's just crazy. So that has certainly affected the U S a lot. Our rail system is also struggling right now, which is the biggest kind of contributor to delays is much like there's not enough containers. There's not enough rail cars and all of that stuff. Um, so, you know, we're working through it best we can. We'll keep you updated as much as possible as things change and shift around. Uh, you know, as I'm sure everybody in the chat realizes there's no giant conspiracy. There's no There's no sadistic pleasure derived from telling you one date and then having it change on us to a different date. If any one of us could snap our fingers and get everything out on time right away, you know, we totally would. Um, But we haven't developed those mutant powers yet. I haven't bargained with the Dormammu for that quite yet. So that's kind of like where we are. Okay, I gotta go back and do this belt really quick. Uh, you know, like, uh, it's kind of beyond my, uh, like, when will the shipping crisis kind of be resolved? You know, I've heard people 
optimistically say 2023, we'll start to see a lot of these problems kind of abate as solutions are found. Cause obviously, you know, it takes time for any, any fix to kind of work its way through the system. So, you know, who knows, right? It could get fixed faster. It, you know, hopefully it won't take any longer. The best we can do is just kind of like, you know, make the best plans, get as far ahead as we can, and then basically be as transparent as possible with everybody about what we can be and what we know and what we don't. And uh, right now, you know, poor, poor Spider-Man, he's somewhere on a train. He's coming. He's trying to get there in the U.S. And then other parts of the world, you know, it just depends on your region and location and kind of what the challenges are there. So everything's, everything's working as can be. Okay, so I'm liking this. This is coming along pretty well. Some pretty cool magic. I have to imagine that VK is going to tell you something about that stuff. Uh, when you're talking about like triggering his abilities, Fallout Blood, yeah. Your role is still your role. Just because you total successes from somewhere else, like your opponent's role, it doesn't change the fact that you didn't roll those. Uh, let's go on to Mordo's skin really quick. So I'm going to grab, what do I want? What do I think will be good here? Tindalus red, no. No, stop giving me reds. Mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I guess I should have looked ahead. Okay. We're just going to use a mix. So we're going to use this Kokum Copper. And we're going to mix it in with a little shrapnel red and probably a little bit of umber and some blue and black. And we're just going to go crazy. My goal here is to kind of make a little bit of a red brown which that cochrane copper is uh, semi-close to. And again, I'm just going to kind of like thin this out a little bit, turn it into a wash. And we'll just bring it across all the skin tones and everything. And then we'll go back through and deepen it up with a nice umber wash. And then we'll use some uh, standard, I think basic flesh is the name of it, and some Ishtar pink from the fantasy game line and we'll highlight using a mix of our brown and our ishtar pink because you know all skin tones kind of utilize the same mix regardless of the end color when it comes to the highlighting so it's that white and yellow white and yellows are how you kind of want to highlight all skin tones to a certain extent And then it's just your ratio mix of how pink versus how how much yellow versus how much white is in there that kind of changes the overall like a really deep ebony or a nice pale like Swedish complexion, a northern northern nation versus a African nation, all those things. It's all basically the same mix of different colors, just in different amounts. Oh, DK's giving away convocation spoilers here. But yeah, we've, with Dormammu, we showed off the first of the two very, very different uh, affiliations and how the leadership works and stuff. So Dormammu is... You're playing Dormammu, you're playing his affiliation and his affiliation alone. Uh, Convocation has their own unique spin on stuff, but it is uh, not the Dormammu way. Uh, so that's kind of fun. It works it works a bit differently, but I'm, uh, I'm excited for people to see it. And then, of course, the tactic cards, as BK is talking about in the chat, are very unique to the convocation as well. 
in that it's a lot of it's a new take on kind of like mystical artifacts and different things and they have kind of their own unique play style in the game and how the convocation gets to utilize them which makes them feel very different from standard team tactic cards because they're not necessarily representative of the characters teaming up or doing something cool they're more representative of these like unique and powerful artifacts that the convocation members have access to whether from the sanctum sanctorum or Comertage, or just from their own personal collection like mordo he's a collector of ancient artifacts for sure he's got several of them in the in the wings here they're not like the infinity gems no all right uh okay so i want to go next I need to kind of mellow out those blacks. We'll worry about that later. I like where those greens are. Is that going on? Let's go ahead and really quick, we'll use some umber and knock in the hair color really, really fast. And then we'll put a black wash over the umber to really deepen it down and make it that nice dark hair color. <laughs> Matar. Skin tone really nice. And hopefully by the time we've kind of laid this down, our skin tone, which looks like I missed a little spot on the neck back here. So let's fix that. It'll be dry and we can go back in and do our first shade wash. Kind of deepen that color down and then we can start working on highlights and stuff. Oop, I pulled them off camera a little bit. There we go. Okay, so with that done, we're gonna grab go back to our kind of brown, a little bit of purple in there. It's gonna be the same color, the same color that we used on the undershirt. It looks like we're dry. You know what? I'm not even going to risk it. Oh, we're like way out of focus. Focus back in. There you go, camera. Not even going to risk it here. Uh, da, 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 da. Instead, I'm going to really quickly, while I let that dry, I'm going to grab some Leander's Gray. And I just want to uh, do some highlighting on that blue sleeve. So we have that undertone going on here. So my only thing here is I'm just gonna come in. I'm gonna start knocking out this. So again, I'm just kind of using that Hold Your Blue as a nice undertone. Put that Leander's gray over. Because the cloth color in most of the images I find is not as rich as that Holder Blue is, but it kind of makes a nice foundational base coat for us to pull across. And so that was kind of the idea of putting it on there along with everything else. So we have that nice translucency of that lighter color so it'll cover a little better and it won't desaturate as much as it would if we'd put it over the Zenith Gray Because we have that nice rich Haldra blue that's going to show through the translucency of the color on top of it. I'll just kind of come through and do a really quick kind of wet blend here on this stuff. Just kind of knock them out again. Let's let that dry and see where that takes us here. So Okay, 
now I think we're now I think we're more than safe to get back in here and wash down our flesh tone. So I'm gonna make him shinier again. Boop. I realize I forgot to get that spot on the neck, but that's okay. I'll just use the wash on it and we'll go from there to see if we need it again. But yeah, as far as like the items go, the gem stuff, the infinity gems were always intended to be pretty unique in terms of how they functioned in play. Um, you know, we don't want to like overwhelm players in terms of like options or having to think about all these different upgrades that your characters might be able to take. And the infinity gem kind of stuff was very much a fun, unique kind of thing for that wave of characters that all came out around the time of Thanos and the Black Order and were themed around the idea of it was kind of the infinity gem season of the infinity gem waves for Crisis Protocol. Similar to now how, you know, we have these different kind of identities and ideas in the game. We get to focus on that stuff, uh, which is really fun. It's fun to be able to kind of like create these little mini blocks of characters and themes that we can go back to at some point. Um, but that also kind of represent unique points in the game history. And, you know, some of those obviously will last the test of time and always have relevance and some of them may not you know make it forever but that's that's quite all right because there's a lot of options and just because x y or z infinity gem isn't you know the most popular most efficient choice or even something that's you know uh, perfectly desirable in the current meta as it evolves that doesn't mean that something won't change that and bring it back or that, you know, the characters that are around that release still don't have value. And I think that's the biggest thing for us is we always want the characters to be the most exciting and important things in Crisis Protocol. And it's definitely one of the reasons why we've talked about a lot how uh, we don't ever plan to ban or restrict characters, only tactic cards and other cards in the game because of that. Um, because the characters are the heart and soul of the Crisis Protocol experience. That's, I mean, hopefully that's what you want to play with. Uh, and so kind of focusing on those things makes that character choice a little more meaningful, a little more exciting, but also not oppressive to the point where it's like, well, you have to do X, Y, or Z with this thing. So uh, You know, very like <laughs> Shumagorath. Shumagorath is like right in there with uh, Galactus and all of the other gigantic Marvel, you know, monstrosities. I'm not entirely sure uh, what base size you would put on a on a little Shumagorath, so it might take some consideration on that one. How to pull that one off correctly? Here, let's hit this back up. What this color. So I'm just coming back in with that Leander with the gray now that that first coat is dried and picking out some spots. Oh, just a few highlights there. There we go. All right, I think we're getting really close to having a nice, uh, very acceptable Tabletop Baron Mordo. Certainly places to go a little further on this. The biggest one is I'm just going to go back through and kind of retouch up this black wash a little bit. I don't want to like completely cover up the blues, but it's a little splotchy. So just one more coat to kind of thicken and strengthen up the colors. And then we can go back through and add some little uh, highlight scritches to the pants and we'll highlight up the boots and all that stuff. So really at this point, I guess in order to get him tabletop ready in the 10 minutes we have, we need to work on that living staff of the tribunal. So 
Uh, more obscure. I and you know, like for so Loki and I asking about which characters we'll see as the game continues. We try our best to keep a mix of both, um, both characters that are highly popular, and obviously there are a lot of versions of certain characters that I think um, people really want to see you know who doesn't want to see a symbiote spider-man someday um who doesn't want to see a new version of wolverine or any of those big like captain marvel captain america iron man all these things so there's there's a lot there's a lot of opportunity for us to do fun interpretations because we can't capture an entire character's history in one character iteration typically. And I think having options for those characters is really great. You know, if you don't want the board control corset Spider-Man, because that's not how you think of Peter Parker or it's not what fits your play style, having that option to go to amazing Spider-Man and have kind of more of the oppressive, like fast, nimble, beat down character is awesome it just lets you play with characters that you know and love in different ways and find new strategies and styles that open up other characters that exist and all that stuff but then on top of that you know i don't want to i don't think that the game and the universe feels as full and as rewarding if it doesn't include characters like crossbones or sin um characters like Who else have we done recently that we can kind of throw into the less less well-known Bob, Agent of Hydra, um, you know, Viper. Those kind of characters really flesh out the world and they make it feel more full and more exciting. So it's a combination of trying to balance everything out. We do our best to do that and make sure that we're exploring the story you know i think hood is definitely another one that well an amazing character and super fun is not somebody who might be at the top of somebody's expectation list oh why do i keep going out of focus here focus because i'm pulling it towards me um not doing a very good job of staying on camera today so there's a there's a lot of different options and opportunities with that stuff. Right, I feel like I really want to wash that staff. I mean, maybe if I was going to go back or if I go back and I might actually just try to do some of the energy effect as the staff is like open. You can see that. So I just mimic the same thing that I did down here on these little spell effects. Get that going on. And dry brushing through some purples and stuff would be pretty good too. Um, what else we gotta do? We gotta get that hair kind of toned down as well. So you'll never see an Avenger Spider-Man. Who knows? Who knows what the future may hold for Senior Parker? But I mean, that's another really great example. A lot of people think of Spider-Man as being always an Avenger, and he's been a reserve member forever. But there's only a pretty specific. There only been specific times where he's been an active member. And that usually doesn't last super long. Sometimes it's a very dedicated run. Sometimes it's not. I mean, in the when he was part of Steve Rogers, was it Secret Avengers? Recently, back when we we knew, but they didn't know that Captain America had been corrupted by the Cosmic Cube and was working secretly for Hydra. I mean, Spider Man was on it for like half an issue, and then he quit because Deadpool was on the team, and he was like, "I can't work with Deadpool. He's crazy." So Spider-Man's always been kind of a do-it, do-it-on-your-own fella. He comes in for short amounts of time and then, and then disappears. Smooth that out a little bit. Well, there's your stability test right there. I flicked that pretty hard. Caught my finger on it, and he's doing just fine. 
All right. And then it looks like we just got to fix the little mess I made up there, and we should be good to go, so. Yeah, I, I thought it was really funny, speaking of Spider-Man quitting the Steve Rogers New Avengers run because Deadpool is on, on the team, and then concurrently at the same time, Marvel's releasing the Spider-Man and Deadpool comic where they're like the best of buds working together on all these zany adventures that typically Deadpool gets them into trouble. So I was like, well, you know, different creative teams, different, different stories, all that stuff. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Cassandra Nova, right? That's another character that, uh, super important and exciting, but maybe not, Oh, not maybe, certainly based on the commentary that we got, not the most well-known X-Men character. Uh, but I think the game gets that opportunity to be an awesome entry point for people to learn about characters they may not be super familiar with or things like that. And that to me is very exciting and it's part of the joy of being able to work on this stuff. And so we get to do like well-known stuff and we also get to explore and play around with characters that don't show up in other forms of media outside the comics or have as much of the spotlight. You're not buying under ruse with this character pictured on them, you know? Uh, but I think all of that is really important to work together so that everyone who loves the Marvel universe can find the thing that excites them and also get to experience something that feels like a complete universe. All right, and with that, just did a really quick brown wash with some chestnut ink over the staff. Give it a little bit of shading. And there we go. So there is our one hour tabletop ready Baron Mordo. Knocked that out of the park, I think. I'm pretty happy with where this character is. I'm going to spend some time before our stream next Thursday where we'll be playing the Dormammu Ultimate Encounter. I'm just going to do some cleanup, uh, take this guy to the next level. I didn't really want to pop those spell effects a little bit, add some extra dimensionality to the smoke, do some highlighting and stuff on all the different colors. But as far as like getting this character looking great for some tabletop play, I'm very happy with where we got him. Uh, so hopefully this gave you some ideas and inspired you as well for how you too can get your Baron Mortars ready when he hits uh, your tabletops here in the next couple months. With that, I'm going to pull this camera off of our Baron Mordo, put it back on to me. He's got a brush in his mouth because that's how I roll. Thank you so much for joining me. Hope you all had fun. Um, very much looking forward to hanging out with you all the rest of this week. We'll be back tomorrow with Dallas Kemp. Uh, he's got some cool stuff to paint up. And then Thursday, he's going to be finishing up the Dormammu from last week. So if you missed that part one, you want to see how he did the reds and the blacks, be sure to jump back to that. That's on Twitch uh, Archive as well as our YouTube channel. And then on Friday, I'll be back to paint up some more cool stuff. And then we'll be returning next week. Again, the big one uh, for everyone here, I'm sure, is going to be that Dormammu Ultimate Encounter playthrough. So if you want to take a look at the Ultimate Encounter for the first time ever, be sure to tune into that. That's going to be at 1 p.m. Pacific Thursday, just like all the other streams we have. Until next time, thank you for joining me. Have a great week. Be good to each other. And we'll see you on the next one. Goodbye.